This is the Thai Capital Millionaire Podcast. This is episode number 81. My name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Todd Millionaire. I'm the founder and the director of the Thai Capital Investment Club. We have over 300 members, also the founder of Todd Acquisitions, which is our real estate club working on six stores right now, hoping to scale into 2019 and do some crazy, crazy things. Uh, we have come a long way from just talking about getting doors to actually having doors. A big part of that is because I get to talk to investors like our guest today every single week. They've pushed me, they've motivated me, and they've informed me on what to do. Even if they didn't know they were doing it, they've helped me along the way. Uh, make sure that you leave us a rating or a review, preferably a five-star review on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Uh, it's definitely appreciated. It helps us get the word out to more people because even though we get a good amount of listens, we're not reaching the true mass numbers that I think we could be reaching if we all work together to push this show forward. Thank you all for tuning in. The purpose of this podcast is to share the stories of successful African American investors and business owners so that people can hear the stories of successful examples because they exist. We believe that business and investing are team sports and that business and investing are the true keys to financial success and generational wealth. With us today, we have a special guest. Her name is Pong. Guy Barnes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go, say it again. Apanji. Apanji Barnes. There we go. Sorry. Okay. I'd, I'd like to make sure I get names correct. I'm going to read the bio because I want to make sure I get everything here. After I read the bio, we're going to go ahead and bring her into the show. So she was born and raised in the south side of Chicago. She's a political science graduate of Southern, Southern Illinois University of Carbondale. She embarked on her real estate career as a college student in 2005 at the age of 20, buying her first condo in Chicago after buying two condominiums during the most recent tumultuous real estate market collapse. She was able to endure and purchase flips and rentals. From 2008 to, to, to 2011, she owned a furniture rental staging business, which was born from her passion of flipping homes and staging them. Subsequent to closing that business, she studied at John Marshall Law School in Chicago. As of late, she has done both rentals and flipping. Her current portfolio consists of properties with a mix of multifamily and single family homes. Her competitive advantage is building a real estate portfolio mortgage free, which I wanna talk about. She is passionate about real estate, but most importantly, inspiring black millennials to invest in real estate. This passion birthed her first book, Real Estate and Chill, which was released in February, 2018. This past summer, she taught in Andre Hatchett's Black Real Estate School and was featured in Crane Chicago Business Newspaper. She enjoys raising her two sons with her husband, who is also her business partner. So with that, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that's a great bio. It's a lot. It's so cool because, and that's why I think that it's good to either have a bio or learn about people's background because it allows people to connect to you as a person, not just the real estate side of you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So that's very cool. I think I know some people who went to John Marshall uh, Law School. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I only did a year there before I dropped out. So <laughs> uh, the first year is the hardest year. The crazy thing exactly. is I'm actually at a law school right now. Oh, okay. And wow. Cause the, the school that I normally record at was closed. Yeah. And so I had to figure out where I was going to record because I can't record in the office because they leave there like 6.30 and it just oh, okay. <laughs> had, to, had to scramble last minute. Yeah. Um, so this is cool. You started investing at a young age. There's just so much to ask you, but I think the first thing I want to ask you is what were you doing before real estate? What did your life look like before real estate? I didn't do anything before that. <laughs> Honestly, I'm young. just a college student. So what I was doing, I didn't have a job. I've never really had a job. Um, even as a teenager, I really didn't have a job. And in my adult life, I've never had one. So what I was doing is I was an entrepreneur and I was selling um, designer knockoffs on eBay. So okay. um, that's kind of like how I was making my way through college. And then I was like saving money. And then, you know, my husband and I decided to save um, to get a, a, a first condo. So um, I don't have a big backstory before real estate. <laughs> That's true, because it starts at 20. 20, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. What What gave you the confidence and the motivation to start at such a young age? 
I think anybody that kind of grew up at that time or was like kind of inundated by media as far as TLC, HGTV with the flip this house, right? Like that was everywhere. So in my mind, I'm 20 and I'm thinking, all you have to do is paint some walls and put carpet down. You can make a hundred K. Like <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Cause that's just how crazy the market was back then. So I talked my husband into it. And we started looking and we were able to, you know, buy the property when I don't think we put much of anything down because back then, right, all you needed to have like was a pulse and can you sign papers? So <laughs> they were giving anybody a loan. So that's kind of how we got started from the, the, the TV shows. Yeah, mm -hmm. we got inspired by that. Nice, nice. So the name real estate and chill, what does that mean? Okay, so like I like I said, I, I really my passion is real estate, but I really want to inspire other Black millennials to get into real estate investing. I think it's a great way to earn passive income, not be tied down to a nine to five, and just pass generational wealth down. Um, and I, my brothers are younger than me; they're probably like maybe between six and nine years younger. And their friends are always asking me like, "How do I get into real estate?" So I wanted to write a book that could reach them because I think there's obviously that thousands of real estate books, but I wanted to tile it with something that they can relate to. And most millennials can relate to Netflix and chill. So yeah. I just played off of those words and that's kind of how I came up with that. So nice. Nice. It's interesting that you say uh, black millennials getting into real estate. I was thinking about this this morning is there's so many ways to increase your net worth. You can work and you can save, you can pay down debt or you can acquire assets. And if you right. know what you're doing, which is acquiring assets, especially if you acquire them at a discount, if you acquire them um, with equity already in, you've basically created instant net worth, which then closes that net worth gap. Right. So there's ways you can close the wealth gap is you can go out there, you can work really, really hard, or you can use your mind, okay. you can create wealth. Exactly. And I think that's important for people to kind of grasp because so many of us are just taught like, go to school, get a good job, save, invest. Yeah and then wait until you're 60, and then maybe you'll have a million dollars in your 401k. Exactly, and I just know too many people that look like me that the, the college degree, degree is not panning out for them. Like, it's not what they thought it was gonna be. They're not getting those salaries that they thought they were gonna get. They, you know, they're like, they have a mortgage over their head that's literally like a student loan debt. So, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, we kind of need to step outside of the box in terms of building wealth, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the first condo, can you talk to us about what that purchase looked like? How did you finance it and okay. what did the rehab and all that stuff look like? Okay, so it did need a lot of work. Um, it took us a long time to find it though because the market was really crazy. But it was a two bedroom, one bath condo. Um, it was in the Beverly area in Chicago. And um, we paid 144 for the property, I believe. And um, yeah, so we paid that. We, we got a loan um, on the property. And um, that was probably like the worst real estate experience I've had. Um, <laughs> um, that one, I, we, we decided to stay there for a year and we made some renovations to it. But like I said, it didn't need a lot of work, but we just did some upgrades like granite countertops. The cabinets were good. So we just put granite in there. My husband tiled the floor and we just kind of did some small renovations to the bathroom. Well, we had no idea that when you buy condos, you could possibly have like special assessments. Right. So when we went to go sell the property, um, we had to actually pay a $13,000 special assessment for um, a boiler system, tuck pointing and a new roof. Mm -hmm. So my lawyer called me on the day of closing. He's like, you got to come down here. I need $1,100 for us to close today. So it was like so sad because I thought I was getting like $14,000 like after closing. And then he said, no, you didn't know that you had a special assessment. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And so I had to actually bring money to close. So yeah, <laughs> that was my first deal. And yeah. Uh, so when you, I want to, I want to talk to you about the first deal, but I also want to find out on the 144, was that an FHA loan or was that a, what kind of loan was uh, that? No, that was a conventional loan. Conventional. Okay. Yeah. So um, it was so long ago. I know we put something down, but it wasn't mm -hmm. like a lot. It wasn't like 20% or anything like that. Like I right. said, this was 2005 where money was very easy to get. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. And so circling back to the first deal, I think it's interesting because I think it's tough to have a good first deal because there's so much that you don't know. Exactly. There's, there's things you think you know, and then there's things that you really don't know that they don't cover in books, that they don't cover in podcasts, that they don't cover just in general conversation. And so like, yeah, it sucks that that first deal is usually not profitable, but it usually helps you make 
the other deal is profitable because then you know what to look out for. Mm-hmm. So. Exactly. Yeah. I guess my, my next question is, what did you learn from that experience that you took going forward? Um, uh, just basically what I learned from experience is with condos, always ask the association before you're buying whether or not they anticipate a special assessment mm-hmm. or if there is one that's active. So just asking those questions and making sure you're very thorough is what I, um, I learned from buying condos. So, nice. yeah, but you know, it didn't deter me. Um, we, we wind up, you know, we decided to keep going. So, yeah. yeah. So when... When we started looking for properties, we looked all across the country Mm -hmm. and we looked in Atlanta, we looked in Baltimore, we looked in Philadelphia, we looked in Las Vegas, we looked in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And when you think about Chicago, Mm -hmm. everybody thinks about the same thing. And so even though the numbers look good, there's this uncertainty, I guess, because you don't really know the market from the ground floor. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick Chicago? Well, I live here, so it was kind of like a no-brainer. Um, I'm, I did have some hesitation on my, my my husband's side because he is from the north side of town um, in the more um, affluent neighborhood on the north side. So he was like completely freaked out at the idea of doing the south side. Yeah. Um, but the, the part that we invest in is very mixed. Um, it's more of an Irish community populated by a lot of police officers. So it's not the real, real South Side, you know, um, it's not Inglewood, it's not that type of neighborhood. Uh, so we kind of stay in the better parts of, of South Side of Chicago. Um, mm-hmm. But I do encourage, if you look at my Instagram, I do encourage people to invest in like, you know, more of the depressed areas, um, specifically Inglewood, because at, there's a Whole Foods there, there's like a pot belly there, you can see that there is gentrification coming, yeah. and they are moving us out. So I want, you know, us to make sure that we are a part of that. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to say that you invest in the hood hood, because that's what I like. <laughs> well, I have one in the hood hood. I only have one in the hood hood. I just, um, yeah, I'm not, I want to be able to, like, I want my brothers to do it with me, because I think that they will be more comfortable right. going into those neighborhoods. I'm just not that comfortable yet. So yeah. the one that I have in the hood is still, the block is really nice. Just going through there is kind of scary, but the block is really nice and the, yeah. the, the older people in the block take care of it. So, right, yeah. right, right. So when people say that they're afraid to invest in Chicago, what do you tell them? I don't think you should be afraid. I think there is a lot of a promise here in Chicago. If you look um, at some of the more prominent um, newspapers, you will see that we're having a tech boom downtown where we have like some of the biggest companies, even Facebook, Uber, Groupon, t- tons of companies that are coming here. As you know, we're pro- we're um, in the running for getting Amazon's um, second headquarters here. So I think that there is so much growth in Chicago, and I think that they are intentionally trying to push Black people out to um, basically make room for the people that they want here. So I don't want us to fall for it and not invest and not reap the rewards of what Chicago is going to be in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you how you keep your residents safe, but it doesn't seem like that's an issue because of where you're investing. Well, I mean, like I said, it's not like, I mean, they're, they're still like, I would say that where I'm in is B minus C neighborhood. So it's still some, you know, riffraff. So, but I do make sure that I actually check on the properties because um, even in nice neighborhoods, there's been like people that are squatting in properties that they see are vacant. And so that's a whole nother, you know, uh, monster. But what I'm doing is I'm using Simply Safe. I don't know if have you heard of that system where it's kind of like yeah. wireless and you yep. keep it in your property, you pay fourteen ninety nine a month. Yeah. So I, I use that wherever um I have a vacancy. And then we also just make sure we're always consistently going by there. We also try to get a rapport with one of the neighbors. Cause if you're friendly with the neighbors, they will look out for you. If they see something right. suspicious, they will call you. But you can't go into these neighborhoods and, you know, not try to make some type of connection. So yeah. that's really important. One of the things that I was hesitant to do mm-hmm. is, is I didn't just want to knock on a stranger's door. So how, how do you successfully knock on a door where they don't know you from Joe? Yeah. Like, how do you approach that? I'm like, cause you've done it. Obviously I haven't right. done it. I'm, we never do it. Um, we always, they're so nosy. They will come outside um, and, and speak to us and they will say like, you know, sometimes they'll come out and say, I hope you're not putting section eight in this house or something <laughs> like that. 
or they'll like, you know, say something like, so you bought this property, what you plan? So I, we've never had to really go up to someone. It's usually they're coming out, taking their garbage out and they see us mm -hmm. or they're kind of walking their dog or, but yeah, they are so nosy where we invest that, that you don't even have to go up there. But I would, I would definitely um, implore you to just go and knock on a door because right. to give someone your card is really important because we had a flip across the street from us and, um, it's a really um, nice neighborhood that I live in, but um, it looked like someone might've got pissed off. It looked like maybe a disgruntled contractor went in there and kind of like took some, kind of did a number on the place. And we felt bad because I couldn't contact the, um, the investor to let him know that his door was open and his house had been trashed. So I called mm -hmm. the police, but I mean, if he would have gave me his number, I could have like got, cause the police still had to figure out who owned it and get the phone number. So it's really important when you're, you know, doing any type of rehab or just renting that you, you know, have some type of connection on the block. Nice. Well, I'll, I'll probably like take them some cookies or something. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a nice <laughs> gesture too. Exactly. Yeah. Not just like for self-interest, but yeah, just right. to offer something up. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't want to get shot. Like that might sound really crazy, but I don't just want to walk up to somebody's door right. and they're just like, who are you walking up to my door? But it's important and it's very necessary to have yeah. as many eyes around your property as possible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. How many units do you own today? Uh, 12. Yeah. 12. And they're all rentals? Yeah. Not rentals. Like any, not, no, no, like current flips. You don't do any flips anymore? I don't have any, I do. I do look a flip once a year, but right now it's a short sale. So mm -hmm. let me see. We've been under contract. This is f month four. So um, whenever we close on it, we'll start working on it. But yeah, we do once like a that. year. Yeah. I like that a lot. I like it because it can, you can you can start to turn flipping into a job, mm -hmm. and I like that you have a consistent flow of rental income. But then you also yeah. make sure you do one flip a year because I feel like that one flip a year can really help you out financially. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. dope. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. I've always I, I've always thought that you had to either be like super duper flip master or don't flip at all. But it seems like you just yeah. you just you pace yourself. Right. I absolutely. I think it's got to be some balance. And honestly, I will tell you that flipping is my least favorite thing to do. I really hate flipping um, wow. because it's so many unknowns with, mm -hmm. with um, rentals. I know it. Like I have my template. I know what I'm doing. I, you know, but with, uh, I think just, you know, not knowing what this on sale, how many times are you going to have to do a price drop on it? Right. You know? So I just think like, but I have to do it because it's part of my business plan. It's the way that we able to self finance our own properties. So it's mm -hmm. a necessary part, but it is my least favorite thing to do. That's so. dope. That's yeah. really cool. That's yeah. super cool. I feel like I, I put out this post once that pretty much said that a flip can really handle a lot of your student loan debt. Mm -hmm. And so like you can have rental income to take care of your living expenses, but if you want to yeah. chunk out some hefty debt, you can do a flip and it can take care of that. Or you can work forever, like we said earlier. With you know, <laughs> and, and keep making minimum payments until you're 80 years old. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Flipping. Yeah. You can knock that out. You can do one or two flips. You're done. Yeah. That is so, so cool. Yeah. This is why I like this, why I like this show. You just I learn something new every day. <clears throat> so what keeps you going? You have 12 units. You're basically, you've hit financial freedom because your mm -hmm. passive income is greater than your living expenses. What keeps you going? What's your goal? Uh, my goal was 80 units. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, it's just my children. I just want to make sure that they never, never feel poverty at all. And I want to yeah. make sure that they don't have to carry the baton of real estate. I would like for them to at least keep half of my portfolio. But if they come to me and they want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, or they want to be the next Jeff Bezos, I want to write that check and I want to finance that dream. You know, that's kind of how Amazon got funded. His parents gave him a check for $250,000 and look where right. he is at. So I never want them to have to go to a bank because we know that mostly t most of the times when you go to the bank with a business plan and you're black, it's not going to get funded. And so I just want to make sure, and I'm, I'm trying to like make sure my children become entrepreneurs. I really don't want them to um, work for someone else. And I mean, I, that means that I want them to go to, to, they can be like a lawyer or a doctor, but have your own practice. Like you shouldn't be working for another mm -hmm. company. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what keeps me going is just making sure that, um, I fund their lifestyle and also my grandchildren. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the crazy part about it is real estate lets you do that. Cause it's not going anywhere. Exactly. Like, that source of income is permanent as long yeah. as you maintain it. So it's like, it's something that's going to outlast you. I heard this quote and he said that your net worth is going to live longer than your body will. 
And mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of us like think about it that way because we're so caught up in yeah. getting net worth or getting rich so we can live right exactly. now. Like we want to live to the fullest, not live forever, which is exactly. what you're asking people to do if you have the net worth. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes so, you have to plant those trees that you will never see, right? So, yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. I want to kind of do a, a deep dive. I'm taking this idea from Bigger Pockets because I think okay. it's super cool. I, yeah, I love that podcast. Yeah. I want to talk about your most recent deal. So, whatever that most recent deal is, okay. um, can you kind of give us an overview of what it was? And uh, okay. then we'll start asking questions about how you financed it and how you found it and all of that. Okay. So um, my most recent deal was in September and it was a two flat um, and it's brick. Um, the asking price was $65,000. Um, we went in and asked $40,000 and then he came back at $45,000. And so we made the deal. Um, it was on the market. The property was on the market for probably like four months or five so we knew that you know the seller was kind of desperate um it might have been longer than that but yeah so we settled on a forty-five thousand purchase price we self-financed it uh, with cash um we did a one thousand dollar earnest money deposit um what else uh the property needs a complete rehab so i estimated about twenty thousand dollars um, it needs a new roof. We just paid for the um, parapet wall because it was crumbling. Um, the roofer wouldn't do it because um, the bricks were crumbling. So I just paid um, a brick um, mason to do all the brick work that needed to be done. So that was about $3,500. And then the roof repair is $7,100 for a brand new tear off roof. Wow. Um, and then in the inside, just needs kitchens and baths. Uh, there are hardwood floors that we're just gonna go ahead and refinish um and we are planning on so it's each two bedrooms and one bath um we're going to probably rent each unit for our, right now what we're receiving on our two bedroom one bath in like the dc neighborhoods like i said but b minus c um we're see, receiving about 1024 to 1080 so we, we plan on renting for about, you know, a little over $1,000. Um, the Perfect. biggest issue with this particular property is the heating system. My husband and I are kind of like bumping heads as far as what we want to do because there's only one boiler system and we will be responsible for paying it. I would like to take the boiler system out and put electric um, bo um, floor heating all around the property because I feel like that will put the cost of heating on the tenant. Um, but my husband feels like it's a brand new boiler system. Well, not brand new. It's 2015, so it's fairly new. And, and he feels like, why would we take this out um, and do that? So that's kind of mm. like where we're bumping heads as far as the heating yeah. system. To me, it makes more sense to put it the, the cost on tenants. It's so expensive in Chicago to heat a property, especially a two-flat for, you know, for tenants. And you have to, by law, keep it at 68 degrees all day from like September, no, October 1st to June 1st. Mm -hmm. That can be expensive. That's going to, you know, definitely, you know, dampen our cash flow um, on that property. So um, other than that, yeah, um, it's a pretty straightforward as far as like the renovations that we're going to make and stuff. So, yeah. So you, you bought it for 45. You're going to put 20 yeah. into it. Yeah. What will it be worth after the rehab? Um, probably about $150,000. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. This isn't a flip. This is just a, um, a buy and rehab. Wow. Yeah. Cause it's a multifamily. I've never flipped a multifamily and yeah. I just feel like I just want to keep it, you know, for my kids long term. So, so the, and the, I like the block. Yeah. The, the dopest thing about that is, so you buy the property, you're in yeah. it for 65. It's worth 90 more than what you paid for it. 85. Yeah. And the money is still yours, though. Like, just because you don't sell it doesn't mean it's not your equity. Exactly. Like, just because it's not in your bank doesn't mean it's not your money. Yeah, I can tap it into it anytime I want to. Exactly. So, yeah. See, um, it's like it's like a flip. Yeah. But not fully flipped. Exactly. Just because you yeah. found opportunity and you created value. Exactly. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can sometimes miss it because they think they have to turn it. They have to sell it in order to yeah. get the cash out. Like, there's that's what net worth is <laughs> like absolutely yeah like what don't people understand about that exactly so 
yeah, I like for that to just, the, my cash to just sit in my properties. I don't like to take yeah. it out. Um, that is dope. I'm really scared of, you know, just overextending myself um, because right. you saw that so with the crash is so many investors, like they got like 30 properties and it was like a house of cards. It just came down. Yeah. So there's a little bit of fear in me as far as, you know, just overextending and, you know, over leveraging um, myself. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's kind of my fear with the bird craze. Like a lot of people are buying, rehabbing, renting, refinancing, but they don't realize like you just walked into a bunch of debt. Like, and those payments have to be paid. Yes. And so it's like at a certain I, point in time, you never know what's going to happen in the future. No. And I try not to judge people's, you know, like the way that they do their real estate investing. But I mean, one-on-one -on -one talking to people, I try to tell people like, be, you know, be leery of those people that are telling you to move fast and, you know, take your money out of this because one bad move, and then also, I just like the fact that Pat, when you have the money in there, like the the check that I get from Section Eight or you know from my market tenant, it's mine. Like right. I pay my property taxes and my insurance, and that's it. But right. when you have all these mortgages, you may make a hundred dollars profit. Yeah. You know what I mean? After you pay your mortgage, so it just it's more fun the way I do it as opposed to <laughs> over leveraging yourself. To yeah. me. That's why it I also. It, it, it's a, it's less stressful too because yeah. then it's like a vacancy is not gonna hurt that bad that's why i take three months to screen because i have right. that luxury because you know i i can take my time i don't have this mortgage payment in the you know on the back of my, my neck so yeah that's another good that's point cool. so <clears throat> when you bought the property and you offered 40 what was the motivation for offering that number um, I would have offered lower, but my agent was like, don't do that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm big on, I, I heard this before and I just kind of stuck with it. If your offer is not embarrassing, it's not low enough. And so um, it has come back to bite me though sometimes because banks don't care, you know, if you give them low ball offers, but I've had sellers that won't talk to me anymore. Mm -hmm. And my agent has to go back and kind of like, you know, um, finesse the deal because I gave such an insulting offer that the seller's like, I'm not even going to like waste my time even going back. Yeah. And forth you. So it depends mm -hmm. on who you're yeah, submitting the offer to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you found the deal, did you find it on the MLS or how did you find it? Yeah, it was on the MLS. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you find a lot of your deals in the MLS? I haven't found anything outside of the MLS. Um, every now and then, my realtor will call me and tell me she has a deal, but for the most part, MLS, yeah. Interesting. So you said that you self-finance with cash, and I think we kind of have an answer to that because yeah. of all the things we discussed leading up to it, but I kind of want to ask you why, because a lot of people don't want to tie up all their cash into a property. What makes you go, I mean, besides what we already talked about, like, why are you willing to put your cash into a property as opposed to trying to use OPM, as they say? Right. Like I said, I just, I just prefer the ownership part of it. And I like being able to not have that, you know, I guess I got it more from listening to Dave Ramsey and his idea yeah. of buying real estate, you know, investments um, with financing. And so I kind of subscribe to that way of thinking. I know some people are like, you are nuts. And I've had investors tell me like, you could grow so much faster with what you have if you would start, you know, taking out loans and stuff. But it's tempting, but I, I'm going to continue to stay on my path and um, mm -hmm. just keep, you know, doing it this way. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I think that um, what I take from that is kind of there's like it's it's not an apples to apples comparison because your 12 units looks different than the next person's 12 units. Mm -hmm. exactly. If you have 12 units free and clear with $100,000 with the equity in each versus somebody that has 12 units that are leveraged 85 percent exactly it's it's not the same 12 units no it's not so. and it, the cash flow is not the same so they yeah. don't see the numbers that i see as far as what i'm bringing in so yeah interesting that's actually very cool because you can get caught up in the race to get the most units instead of the race to have like the most strategically placed balance sheet absolutely yeah that's a very yeah. good point yeah yeah So your exit strategy on this current deal, what does that look like? Um, I'm just going to, I have a timeline of March having it rented out by then. So I'm going to rent, uh, rent both units. Um, I'm probably going to do one section eight and one uh, market tenant. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the question I was going to ask you is, um, 
I forgot the question. Okay, it'll come back. <laughs> it will. It has something to do with renting those units. Oh, so you said that you're going to rent it out in March. Does that have anything to do with the weather, or is that just yeah, it's time? better. Yeah, I've rented okay. stuff in the winter. Um, it's terrible. Um, sometimes people don't show up. It just takes such a longer time. So springtime, March and April is when I like to, if I can, you know, mm -hmm. hold off. I like to just do it. And that'll give me enough time to finish the rehab. So that's what I figured. Mm -hmm. That's kind of thought. That's what I thought you were getting at. Yeah. So twelve units. Um, how many deals though? Um, I've done over 20 something deals because I've done a lot of, like I said, I've done, I've done a flip a year. So yeah, it's, it's um, been over 20 something deals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your most difficult of those deals? And can you tell us um, a story about that one? Difficult. Um, well, I bought a property um, and I sold this property. I made my money back, but I wasn't like, I didn't flip it. I bought it as a rental property. And when I bought the property, um, the property next door went for, got foreclosed and um, they boarded up the property. And then all of a sudden, like I started noticing like a lot of traffic across the street with people selling drugs. And so even though we were like maybe six blocks away from the police station, they weren't coming by enough to like stop it. So that was a nightmare because it was like, I was finding great candidates to rent it. And they were like, I don't want to live here next to a boarded house. So that scared them off. And then when I would have showings, it's a like 12 deep, like, you know, people hanging out across the street and you know what they're doing. So um, that one was like a nightmare. Cause it's just like, you, you know, you can't hide the fact that, you know, uh, it's so much chaos going on in, on the block. So um, I wound up selling that property about two years ago. Um, but I, the thing about it is like, I had such a bad um, feeling when I bought that property. And I remember being pregnant. I remember like, you know, when I signed the deal, my husband like, I don't know. But we were like, you know, we need a property. You know how you just get the feels where you just need a property and it's like not a lot to choose from, but you see a lot of red flags, but you just do it anyway. And so, yeah, that one just made me realize that you have to listen to your um, instincts when you're dealing with it. Like, it's not always about the numbers. Sometimes you have to, um, you feel like a gut feeling that it's not a, the best investment. You know, sometimes you just need to back away. So, yeah, that one, um, yeah, that was probably my worst one. And it attracted the worst tenants possible. Honestly, it, it was a headache. So, yeah. So yeah. I was going to ask you how you got around that problem, but it seems like you just tolerated the problem until you could sell it. Yeah, I, I couldn't do anything else. And then another investor wound up buying it from me. So I only made like $10,000 extra off of what I bought it for. Um, but the good thing was I didn't lose any money. So I just took it in and reinvested it and I was able to get two more properties. So it worked out. But yeah. Did you buy that property in cash also? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how are you accumulating this this cash are you guys just kind of stacking away or are well like that's the, that's the thing when we have um flips we make really really good um the thing about my neighborhood is that you can buy like for instance i just had a flip um in the springtime and um i sold it for one hundred and twenty four thousand dollars. now i bought this property on auction um on hudson and marshall um sight unseen for twenty four thousand dollars a nice brick house it was um three bedroom two baths and i bought it for twenty four thousand um dollars and the closing cost was like maybe three thousand dollars because um it was auction they put you know their up sales on there or whatever and so i bought that and then we put maybe probably like twenty thousand dollars into it and then we sold it for 124 so we're making pretty good you know profits on our flips so it's, it enables us to just keep going and mm -hmm. reinvesting it so yeah so yeah you we guys so it sounds like you actually, it sounds like you actually live out of the rental income but mm -hmm. you use your flips to generate the capital exactly. to buy more doors interesting yeah. i thought mm -hmm. i thought you guys were uh kind of i mean because some people what they do is they have a job they have a nine to five they have rentals but then they would just be stacking the money from their rentals Mm -hmm. but it seems like you guys are truly living that passive income lifestyle. Well, my husband has a full-time job and we, you know, stack his income, but yeah, we, we have like multiple sources of income and That's then like, 
to just do the flipping because um, I just feel like it gives me that lump sum of cash um, to do the real estate investing. And then the other, I can, you know, save, you know, a way for retirement or different things, mm -hmm. the accounts that we, and goals that we have. So, yeah. How does working with your husband benefit your business? <laughs> okay. So it's good and bad because, you know, we get on each other's nerves sometimes and we dip for an opinion about different things but um i like it because it's just like it's nice to have that partner especially when you have like um you know sometimes in business you have to uh put your ego aside when you're dealing with different things and decisions that need to be made and you may not be feeling that way but the other person is willing to like take it on the chin and deal with it so for instance um i have a tenant and we um had an issue over the summer with her having bed bugs and so um, in Chicago, if you have bed bugs, the, the landlord is responsible for um, remediating it. And so we paid for the remediation, but she called recently and said that, oh, I think I see another bed bug, but I was like really aggravated because I just felt it was unfair. She's been in there four and a half years. It's a single family home. Like, I just feel like the law has no common sense to it. So mm -hmm. ever since then, I've told him to communicate with her. And so um, recently she said she saw it again and I reached out to my um, pest control and he, he said that he's in Puerto Rico and he'll be there <laughs> to the family member died. Well, she's still hounding us. So anyway, my husband's like, well, she says if you, if we um, pay her another exterminator 150, you know, um, it'll, you know, eradicate the problem. But I feel like I just wrote a check for 650 and you need to be patient and just wait for, you know, my exterminator to get back in town. But he's like, it's not worth it. Like, you know, she's going to be a headache. She's going to call CHA, you know, you just, so he was able to just deal with it and just say, here's the 150 to the contractor and pay it and just kind of, cause I'm just in a bad mood about it. Like I'm still right. mad about it. So having that partnership and having that other person to kind of be the good guy and bad guy type situation, it really helps out. Right. Right. I think that I'm sure you realize this, but you might not realize this. But I really feel like working with your your spouse gives you an advantage mm -hmm. um, for a lot of different reasons. But one of my favorite quotes is that business and investing are a team sport. And so I put out this post. And I always say people, it's on my website. <clears throat> and somebody put out a post and they said, yeah, look at what Charles said. Business and investing are a team sport. And they said something along the lines of that it's a good idea to work with your friends and family. I don't think that that quote says that though. I think that quote says that if you're going to achieve wealth, you've got to work as a team. Mm -hmm. Anything else is not going to achieve wealth. And so I feel like if you don't have two people on the same page, if you don't work with your family, if you don't work as a team mm -hmm. and you're realizing, you're wondering why am I not wealthy? Well, exactly. it, That's it's, true. It's, a, it's an element. It's not a factor. Mm -hmm. It's part of the rule. Exactly. So yeah. When I see people like you and, Charm City Buyers and Kendra Barnes and Hood Estates, there's no coincidence that they're doing very well. Mm -hmm. They have two people that live right. exactly. 24 hours a day together working towards the same goal. And they're yeah. out there competing with people who are doing it on their own. Right. And why they keep striking out. I'm very passionate about that because I feel like in the community, a lot of the reason why we struggle has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with we're trying to be strong and independent. Mm -hmm. so I really encourage people to like be interdependent yeah. Because a woman brings something to the table that a man never could, and a woman and a man brings something to the table that a woman never could, no matter how hard they try. Exactly. And um I've seen my life definitely transform now that I'm married as opposed to when I was a single person out there doing single person single single people things. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What was your favorite deal? Um, my favorite deal was um, a flip that I did, um, and I paid uh, $60,000 for it, um, and we flipped it, and we sold it for, like, one eighty nine. Um, I like that property because it was just fun designing it and everything. It was like, you know, yeah, so it was, and it didn't stay on the market that long. It kind of sold quickly. So that was like one of my favorite deals. Um, that was a four bedroom, two bath brick property um, that I got for $60,000. And it actually came with tenants, but they actually wound up moving out the day that we bought it. So it was like really great because that would have been my first time experiencing having to evict someone. So um, that was that was that was a, a perfect coincidence that they moved out. I think they got some type of cash for keys type of deal from the bank or 
something like that. So, yeah. So, so when you buy properties with tenants in it already, you just let them go. You don't try to keep them. I've never bought one with a tenant oh. in it. Never oh. had that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would What would you do in that situation? Do you think you'd keep them, or do you think that depends on what kind of tenants they are? Um. Well, I'm the, the short sale has tenants in there, and the uh, owner keeps telling me they're gonna move out. Now, recently, she told me they were gonna move out on October fifteenth. When I drove over there last week, they were they were there. So yeah. I'm really praying that they move out. But if it if they don't, um, I'm willing to like do a uh, cash for keys type deal. Mm -hmm. Um, just because the eviction process and costs here are just absorbent to to yeah. evict someone, and I'd rather just pay you know a, a yeah. cost to get them out. So okay. I don't think they were that. Rent, so, yeah. Oh, whoever invented that cash for keys is a very smart person. It definitely yeah. helps save time and money. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. I've blown through all my questions. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you okay. a few wrap up questions Okay. and um, I'll let you enjoy your Friday night. Okay. <laughs> what is your best real estate advice? Uh, my best real estate advice is I think that if you're going to get started and you don't own any property, I think you should get a multifamily and try to max it out at four units with the FHA loan for 3%. And, you know, I think that's a great way to get started if you don't have like a lot of money yeah. and, you know, it's your first time getting into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who is somebody that you look up to and why? Um, it's, it's probably, uh, I guess, Oprah Winfrey. Um, the reason why is because she's big on ownership like I am. Like, I really believe in owning your stuff. And so the fact that she wanted to, you know, she was doing really great with her ratings, but she decided that wasn't good enough. She was going to own her own TV show. So she owns the rights to Oprah Winfrey, um, you know, talk show. And then the fact that after she ended that, she decided to do the own network. So yeah. I just admire that because I'm That's really big on ownership as well. So. You know what? I didn't know that. I didn't know that she was big on ownership. I saw a clip yeah. kind of flow down my, my Instagram or Twitter feed recently. And the comment looked like something I should be watching. I just wasn't in position to really watch it because I was like, I couldn't pull, turn on the sound. But I need to do some more research on that because it's, start, it's starting to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. interesting because it's not something that's widely talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's just not it's and so she crazy a lot of real estate here in chicago as well she had a lot yeah. of real estate in chicago so yeah i just i admire that yeah yeah i think it's it's interesting because there's this area in newport beach i was in once and i was talking to one of the guys and he's like massively wealthy the house was worth 20 million dollars overlooking the cliffs 20 million dollars in the community that has like four million dollar homes and he's a nobody and i was like there's so many wealthy nobodies exactly so like yeah Mm -hmm. You can be a wealthy nobody. I want to be a wealthy nobody. I don't exactly. want to be. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You don't need your face plastered everywhere. Exactly. That's true. That's yeah. what the true wealth is, right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite business book? So that kind of piggybacks off what you just talked about um, with the wealthy nobody. So my favorite book is um, The Millionaire Next Door because that book highlights how many wealthy people there are that are living amongst us and you don't even know it. And they're driving some 89 year old, 89 uh, Mercedes Benz. And you know, they have the same uh, Walmart clothes on and you have no idea they have like millions in their um, bank accounts and they own right. so much real estate and business. So I love that book. Um, I think it's Stanley Moore that wrote that book. So I like that. Yeah, but, um, the reason why I like that book and, I, and a lot of people will fight me when I say this, because a lot of people, when they hear the concept of like being frugal, or they'll say like, oh, you can't save your, yourself to wealth. But I think that the odds are so much better when you live that way, that you can achieve wealth, or if not wealth, at least comfort, versus if you spend everything that you make with the mindset that I just got to make more money. Yeah. So it's like, if you're just smart with the money that you have, a lot of people fight me on that. They say, oh, you can't, they said that if you just don't wear Jordans anymore, that you can be, you can be rich, but that's not true. Because if I put my Jordans money in a 401k and I, it makes 12% a year, like it's only going to be this much money. I don't want to wait 20 years. But They're missing the point. They're missing the right. point. Yeah. <laughs> you can be wealthy off $50,000 a year. It depends on what your, your, um, what your out, output is. So if you have bills that are $1,000 and you bring it in $4,000 and you have $3,000 excess, you're probably doing better than somebody who's making a hundred K who has 10 K going out every month. So exactly. it totally depends on what your bills are and your overhead. I think people get obsessed with, 
I'm going to make all this money and then I'm going to go buy a Range Rover. I'm going to go buy the biggest house in the biggest suburb. And then you are working to live. You like a little milestone on the racetrack. You can't get off because if you do, you lose everything. And who wants to live that way? So, yeah, I think simplicity is better. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, I, the reason why I like it so much is because it really gives people that path. Mm-hmm. It's like you already have a job, you already have income, you're already going to get a tax refund, you're already going to get all these things. So if you just reshift your mind from saying, okay, I got a tax refund, I got to go buy a Louis, so I got a tax return, I just want to let it sit here. Mm-hmm. Now you're $5,000 richer heading into the next year. So now when an opportunity pops up, you can take advantage of that opportunity. Mm-hmm. So that, that compounds. And then you mm-hmm. save money from that opportunity and that compounds. So you start yeah. the cycle, but you can't start the cycle if you have nothing. Like, yeah. Some people don't even have an emergency fund. Their tiger gets slashed and they're like borrowing from someone else. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. On that. It kind of liberates people also from trying to have to like spend money to look like they have it. It's like if we normalize this lifestyle of like having money but not looking like money, then you don't have to feel like you have to compete with somebody because they have the new sunglasses, they have the new shoes. Yeah. You can just say, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna work. Like I got on a white t-shirt and some chucks. Like okay, exactly. and then that excess yeah. money is. Exactly. Look at Mark Zuckerberg with a hoodie on and some jeans. I mean, come on. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. With that said, what's the craziest thing you've purchased? <laughs> I guess that's bad timing, but um, I like that question. Bought a Rolex for me. So, yeah. Cool. That's very cool. It's cool because the last guy, he said that when he gets successful, he wants to get a Rolex. And oh, you are okay. successful and you have a Rolex. I think that's super yeah. dope. I mean, we're not where we want to be, but he wanted to splurge and do that. So that, yeah, I I appreciate it. I like it. I like it. You can leave it to your kids. (laughs) It's like an asset too. Mm -hmm. What do you think separates successful investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Um, Just keep going going because you're going to have some rough times. This is not easy. And especially with the personalities that you deal with in this business, um, it's tough. So you have to have the tenacity and you have to have the mindset of like, you know, looking towards the future. You can't look at the now. So um, you can't let like little spats or like one bad tenant say that, oh, well, real estate sucks. Cause that's what I, I get that so much is not even re- funny. Like I know when I'm in a room full of my people, meaning that like millennials and people that I'm trying to inspire because they take to it. But let me go and talk to somebody in a 40 plus older or 50. They're like, real estate there's no chilling in real estate and have you like they're just like very skeptical and they tell me these I have to hear about 20 stories about how their grandma had a bad experience their neighbor so I think that's what separates us is that I've had some terrible terrible um tenants and bad experiences but um at the end of the day I own the property and that's just one what's just one tenant there are better tenants out there and I'm doing this for my children I'm doing it for my children's children so yeah Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And I don't want to let you go, but the last <laughs> question is, what does wealth mean to you? Um, wealth means it's freedom. Freedom to be able to do what you want to do and not be, you know, tied to um, what society says you should be doing. Um, also, I think that wealth is, you know, being able to pass down what, when you die, something that can live on. So I think mm-hmm. that, you know, that's what wealth means to me. Pass it on. where can people find out more about everything you have going on where can they buy your book where can they follow you on the internet okay so my book um real estate and chill is on amazon it's also an audio book on amazon it's also on itunes on amazon That's and cool. it's on barnes and noble as well um and then also you can follow me on instagram at real estate and chill um, and then also you can find me on Facebook at Real Estate and Chill. Also have a YouTube channel at Real Estate and Chill. And I'll also be uh, having a course um, for people that want to get into real estate. Um, and that'll be coming sometime next year. So nice. Yeah. Very cool. So thank you for coming on the show. I learned a lot. I wish that I could have just like kept you talking because you have so much. But I think we, I, we did get a lot of value out of this episode yeah. for sure. Just from yeah. talking about your journey. Um, yeah, this was fun. This was the second podcast I've had. I had one yesterday. That was my first one. So you were my uh, second one. So this who, was who, was, who was the first one? Um, Frank Tallis. Do you know him? Um, yeah, he um, he reached out to me on, on Instagram as well. He was doing his um, video from Bali, India. 
So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I did one. Yet, and then I have another one Monday. So mm. um, that one's um, before the million. So yeah. oh, I know that guy. I know that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You plan on doing any traveling this winter? I'm going to Mexico next week for my birthday. So nice. um, I'll be leaving next Friday. Yeah. Very cool. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. So this is episode number 81. I wish I could have got her for episode 80 because that's a landmark <laughs> episode. But nevertheless, we've crossed. We've, we're over the hill now. We're past mm -hmm. 80 episodes. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's so crazy because I look back at who we've had on this show and it blows my mind that I've had them on the show. Um, we've had Juan Pablo, we've had Lisa Phillips, we've had Al, uh, Al Williamson, like really, really dope people. And now we have you. Oh, and okay. um, it's just so much African-American yeah. wealth being created. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that more people are inspired by this show. So yes. if you guys are interested in joining either of the investment clubs, you can always email us at membership at capitaltide.com. You can also find us on the website at www.capitaltide.com. Uh, my name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Top Millionaire, signing off. All right.